not Muslims. Islam did not exist <clears throat> until many centuries later, the seventh century. It didn't even begin to exist even incipiently uh, with, with Muhammad the prophet or, or their prophet as they call him and so forth. So absolutely not Muslim. Additionally, they were more than likely Medes from Persia, from Media, what had been Media Persia at the time of Jesus' birth, an area of Parthenia. The Medes are the ancestors, the genetic and anthropological forebearers of the modern Kurds, of the modern Kurdish people, who are, are probably the only people in Iraq the West can trust. They were also a nation that ethnically was never particularly hostile to Israel or the Jews. Now let's talk about these Medes. The priesthood of the Medes were the Magi. The priesthood of the Medes were the Magi. Many people have speculated that they were practicing astrology and knew by astrology Jesus was coming. This, of course, is nonsense. Let's understand how they knew why Jesus was coming, but also dispel the myth that there were only three of them. We do not know how many they were. Names were actually given to them in later traditions like Balcazar and so forth, but these were made up or invented by the church at a much later point, several centuries later in the post-Nicene era. We don't actually know their names and we don't know how many there were, but there was more than likely quite a contingent of them. Now, the reason they come up with three is because of the three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold because the Messiah would be a king, incense because he'd be a priest, and also myrrh because he'd be anointed for burial. He would die for our sin and then raise to give us eternal life. So the three gifts they apportioned to three kings assigned names, fictitious names at a later point. Who were the Magi? The Magi had been the wise men of Babylon. They were absorbed into the Media Persian Empire, but they were not, sorry, cut, take that out. Okay, we can edit. <laughs> Who were the Magi? The Magi were the priesthood of the Medes, not to be confused with the wise men of Babylon. Later on, when the prophet Daniel had his encounters with the kings of the Medes, you had Darius the Mede, who became beneficial to Israel and the Jews, as we read in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. We also had another king of the Persians, Ahasuerush, remembering that the Persians and Medes were aligned, sort of like the United Kingdom of Scotland, England, Wales, something of that nature. Um, they monotheized under the influence of Daniel the prophet. Now later on, another monotheistic religion called Zoroastrianism would emerge. Ancient and original Zoroastrianism followed the teachings of Zarathustra. It was very compatible with the ideas and religious beliefs of, of, of the Jews and Christians in many respects. It's mutated into some kind of fire veneration and things like this over the centuries but the original teachings of Zarathustra would not have been largely incompatible with the teachings of the Hebrew prophets and later of Jesus. He believed in personal moral responsibility um, and various other teachings that sort of resemble some of the things we read in the Dead Sea Scrolls with the sons of darkness and the sons of light. Zoroastrianism was the original religion of Persia, not Islam. Persians are Aryans. Iran comes from Aryan. In other words, they are Indo-Europeans. They're not Semites. They're not a Middle Eastern people in their origin. They are, are European people, similar to the ancient Greeks, who lived, who migrated into the Middle East. It was also the Persians who began Hinduism in its primordial form in the Indus Valley in India. Uh, Hinduism was not an original belief system of, of India. Uh, it, it was brought there by Persians. But these Persians, at the time of Darius the Mede, became highly influenced by the Hebrew prophet Daniel and also Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and others had an influence that theologically permeated the thinking of the Medes and of the Persians. They were taught the Hebrew scriptures by Daniel. 
their kings believed in the God of Israel, we are told in the book of Daniel. One of the prophecies in the book of Daniel is in, I'm sorry, uh, cut my mistake. Okay. okay. One of the prophecies in the Torah concerning the Messiah that they would have likely learned from Daniel was from the book of Numbers, chapter 24, verse 17, speaking of the Messiah. Uh, and again, the rabbis, ancient rabbis, the sages agreed this passage was messianic and prophetic. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Sheth. Edom shall be his possession. Seir, its enemies, also will be a possession, while Israel performs valiantly. One from Jacob shall have dominion, and will destroy the remnant from the city. Now this is a prophecy, of course, about the second coming of Jesus, as well as his first. It's a prophecy of his second coming, as well as his first, similar to what we would see in Zechariah 12.10, similar to what we would see in Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. The passage is cut in half. The first half of the passage speaking of his first coming exclusively, the second half speaking of his first coming and his second, primarily his second. They knew a star was going to come forth to show a ruler would be born in Israel. This is the notion of the scepter. Now this relates to the prophecy of Jacob to the tribe of Judah in Isaiah chapter 49. The scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. The kingship of Israel had been established in Jerusalem, in Judah, yet it was still called Shiloh, which had been the de facto capital for 200 years where the Holy Ark was. And Shiloh, Shiloh, became a metaphor for the Messiah in Hebraic thought. The rabbis confirmed this, the ancient sages confirmed this. It's a prophecy of the Messiah. So the Messiah had to come, okay, but he would come and then the scepter would depart from Judah. There was no Davidic line anymore, but the royal capital had been in Jerusalem under Herod the Great. Geographically, it was in the tribe of Judah. When Herod the Great died, the Romans appointed proconsuls, surrogate Roman governors. Pontius Pilate did not rule from Judah. He did not rule from Jerusalem. He would come to Jerusalem at certain times, and he would stay at the Fortress Antonio, but his capital was in Caesarea on the coast. This is verified by history, by archaeology, by Josephus, and in fact, a stone with his name commemorating it was discovered in Caesarea. It's in the museum in, in Israel, the, the Israel Museum, but it, there's also a facsimile of it where it was located next to the archaeological ruins in Caesarea Maritina on the coast of Israel, about 35 minutes drive south of Haifa, the largest underwater archaeological dig in the world and a fantastic place to see Roman, uh, Byzantine, and Crusader and Jewish ruins. That was Pilate's capital. At the time, it was the fourth biggest city in the world. After Rome, after Alexandria, and after, uh, I believe, Antioch, it was the fourth biggest city. It was slightly larger than Athens had been. It was a huge, huge city with a Jewish population, but a massive Greco-Roman population. This was Pilate's capital. The scepter departed from Judah, so the Messiah had to come already. This was the idea of the scepter. So Herod begins freaking out. Herod the Great begins freaking out when the Magi come. And he begins freaking out for two reasons. First of all, Herod the Great is a major, major type of the Antichrist. We explain this in my book, Shadows of the Beast, and why he's so important in understanding the Pesher interpretation of Revelation chapter 12. I only mention that, you'll have to order the book, Shadows of the Beast. We can't go into it now for the sake of brevity. But he was an Idumean ethnically. He was an Arab. He was an ethnic Arab. But by religion, he was a Jew. But culturally and politically, by citizenship, he was a Roman. 
the Romans considered him to be a Roman, the Arabs considered him to be an Arab, and the Jews considered him to be a Jew. This teaches something about the Antichrist and how the Antichrist is going to broker a false peace in the Middle East. He'll attempt to be as all things to all people. Everybody's going to think he's one of them, when in fact he's Satan's man, not man's. Nonetheless, this is Herod the Great. He represents the Roman government at this particular time. The scepter had not departed from Judah geographically as yet. However, the one rival in the East, not an overall rival for global domination, but a rival in the East to Rome was the Parthians. They were the descendants of the Persians, or they were the Persians with a different name. Much the same as today, the Iranians are a Persian with a different name, a Parthian was a Persian with a different name. There was a Jewish community in Parthia at that time. We know this from the book of Acts chapter 2 and from other sources. Nonetheless, they withstood the Romans for 300 years. There had been armed conflict between them and the Ro Rome on and off for many, many years. So there was a strategic threat. They were the one people in the East that the Romans didn't want to fight too much. It was certainly to the East, the Parthians were like the Celts were in the West. The Romans took England, except for the Celtic area of England, Cornwall. They failed to take Wales, even though they attempted to and invaded it. And they built Hadrian's Wall across the English-Scottish border. They didn't want to fight with the Celts. They were too fierce. It wouldn't have been worth it. Even if they won, it would have been at too high of a cost. They called the Ireland Hibernia, and the Romans said that the Irish Celts were people who all their wars were happy and their songs were sad. Things haven't changed much. But they didn't make a distinction between the Cornish, the Scottish, the Welsh, the Irish. They were all Celts to the Romans. They fought them when they had to, but didn't push their borders any further. It would have been too costly. Well, in the East, what the Celts were in the West, in the East, the Parthians, the Persians were. They fought them, fought them, fought them since the time of Alexander the Great. Persia had always stood as a threat. Always stood as a threat, even though Alexander the Great did beat them. They still emerged, and they confronted Rome for 300 years. So the fact that a contingent came from Parthia, that would have disturbed him as a Roman official. Secondly, again, he's a type of the Antichrist. The Romans proclaimed him to be king of the Jews. America Yehudim, king of the Jews. When the Magi come and say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Herod begins to twitch. He begins to freak out. He knew about the Messiah. He knew there were Messianic prophecies. He asks the Levites to tell him, and they give him the prophecies of Micah chapter 5, verse 2, etc. The Magi came. How did they come? Were they practicing astrology? This is nonsense. There was a strong monotheistic influence in Persia and in Parthia because of Daniel and his comrades. Later, because of Esther and Mordechai, there was a strong Jewish influence. There had been a Jewish influence in Nineveh under the prophet Jonah, where these people came to see there was one God. Having learned the Torah from the Hebrew prophet Daniel and his colleagues, the royal priesthoods and the pagan priesthoods of the Magi, of the Medes, would have been aware of the messianic predictions. A star shall come from Jacob, a scepter shall rise from Israel, and he's going to all this conquest and so forth. They follow the star. They see this as a fulfillment of the prophecy. Now what becomes really tragic is the rejection of Yeshua, of Jesus, by the Sanhedrin and the Jewish religious establishment. They take this prophecy that applied to Christ, to Jesus, to Yeshua, that the Magi knew. And in the second century, apply it to Simon Bar Kokhba. 
his name meaning son of the star in Aramaic. Rabbi Akiva, a type of the false prophet, proclaims this Antichrist, Bar Kokhba, to be the Messiah. He was later called Bar Kizba, the son of a lie, yet he's still revered as a military hero, even in modern Israel, even though he got the nation obliterated and scattered into the diaspora for nearly 2,000 years. This is Bar Kokhba, because as the son of the star, they misapplied this prophecy to him. The Magi correctly applied it to Jesus. How many, we don't know. How many there were, we don't know. But it is poetic license to say there were three because they bought three kinds of gifts. There could have been 300. We just don't know. They may have even had some kind of an escort because they were going into Roman territory. We don't know. But the air of a potential strategic threat would have been there. The Romans were terrified of sedition. And remember, Herod was politically a Roman. They were afraid of any kind of a Jewish uprising. Later, Yeshua would be falsely accused of trying to supplant the position of Caesar by the Sanhedrin because the Sanhedrin knew Pilate would be coerced into executing him for it. Or Herod's the same thing. He's trying to protect Rome, but he's trying to protect his own position as the king of the Jews. This had nothing to do with astrology. It had to do with the fact that their forefathers, the priests of the Medes, that's who the Magi were, were taught the Hebrew scriptures by Daniel. They were exposed to these influences and theological principles of prediction of a messianic redemption and conquest, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Esther, Mordechai, etc. These things are well recorded in Old Testament history. And we have the messianic prophecy of Numbers chapter 24 of this star that was going to come. A star that will come from Jacob, a scepter shall arise from Israel, and it's going to show where this conqueror is. They knew the king of the Jews. Again, the term scepter synonymous with rule, with kingship, with uh, malchut in Israel, in uh, Hebrew. That is the background of the Magi. That is the background. Now they teach something about the last days. Remember, Jesus said, then they will see the sign of the Son of Man, and the tribes of the earth will mourn. Well, when the sign of the Son of Man came, and the Magi knew it, it said not only was Herod troubled, but all Jerusalem with him. His first coming teaches about his second. We'll be filming this and going into depth about this in uh, our Christmas Hanukkah conference in Devor, coming up on the 14th through the 17th of December in California, San Bernardino. Details are on the Morio website and Facebook page. Nonetheless, this was the background of the Magi. Nothing to do with astrology, and they were certainly not Muslims. How many? We don't have a clue. But thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Fash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, a questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea. It's an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating 
with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be shadows of the beast, shadows of the beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Parpezzo. Parpezzo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, Lum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Parpezzo, all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you.